Schultz, J. Schoenberg uh, Curator of Manuscripts here at the Schoenberg Institute, and it's my pleasure to uh, speak to you today to show you uh, our uh, MS Codex 2076, and I'm going to put a link in the chat to the catalog record. Uh, this is exciting uh, for me to present to you because this is a new acquisition, uh, something that we um, purchased uh, this year um, for uh, the collections here at Penn, uh, and um, it has not yet been digitized, although it's been wonderfully cataloged by uh, my colleague and friend Amy Hutchins, and I'm relying a lot on her amazing uh, description of the manuscript uh, as I present it to you today. So I'm going to get started and uh, turn on the overhead camera and show you uh, MS Codex 2076. All right, now I've turned the uh, sound on as well um, from the overhead camera so that you can hear uh, the pages turn, which is always a bit of a thrill. So this manuscript, it's quite hefty. I'll sort of try to just uh, tilt it up a little bit so you can see it's quite a large uh, manuscript. It's uh, actually a missal uh, from the second half of the 15th century uh, produced in uh, Italy. And so this is the missal. This is the book that contains all the texts for uh, the uh, Christian liturgical service uh, throughout the year for a priest to follow along and say. And missals um, are usually um, one of either two types. So uh, they're either books that are very heavily used because they were carried around by itinerant priests, or they're very splendid large volumes that were made to be stationary and to stay at one uh, religious foundation and so don't have uh, don't have uh, much wear and tear. And this is an example of the latter. Last year, we, or actually in 2021, yeah, last year we acquired uh, a smaller missile that it was of the kind of first type. So a missile that would be carried around by an itinerant priest that's in really kind of poor condition. This is uh, an example of a much more elaborate and much more beautiful missile. And missiles are often, um, kind of high-end, high-status books because they're made for uh, the Christian liturgy. Uh, and so a lot of money was invested in them because they were important books that were uh, put on a lectern on the altar and read from by the priest. So um, often sort of no expense was spared. This uh, book, we were able to acquire it from uh, a local bookseller and it has some uh, early 20th century provenance uh, in New England, which is interesting to us. It's always a thrill to be able to acquire medieval manuscripts that have been uh, in this country for a long time. Um, and you can see here, uh, we have a, uh, the, in pencil, a signature of someone, uh, J.A. Shanley, Lowell, Massachusetts, and what looks like a price code up here. I'm not sure if you can see it, but it's a few letters that look like a dealer price code and uh, a, a Mrs. Buren. So we're working on sort of tracking down uh, these owners, uh, which look to be early 20th century owners um, in, um, in New England. So um, the missile has some uh, end leaves. It has an end leaf here and one at the back, uh, which are kind of extraneous to the manuscript but they're interesting because they are notarial records. They're probably kind of recycled or reused, bound into the volume. Um, and this is writing of the 13th century, a kind of uh, uh, secretarial writing. Uh, and it uh, mentions interrogations related to a Franciscan community in Verona. So this is in Northern Italy uh, in the Veneto. And that may be a hint as to where uh, the, the, the remainder of the manuscript comes from. So we have this uh, um, sort of extraneous end leaf here. Um, and then we get to the, the kind of um, proper part of the missile, um, which starts with a calendar. Now, if you followed us on Coffee with the Codex, you've probably seen some books of hours. Uh, these are prayer books for lay people that also start with calendars. Well, missiles habitually start with the calendar as well. Um, and often the calendars and missiles are more complicated because 
they're meant to be used by kind of educated priests. Although this one's a relatively simple one that has the um, uh, uh, the lunar cycle, the dominical letter, and the kind of um, a talons number, uh, which is all all has to relate to how the calendar is used to establish the days. Uh, what day is a Sunday in a given year? Um, what day is a full moon? Um, and to using the Roman, how to use a sort of Roman um, system of numbering days with talons, ides, and knowns. And I think we've had other sessions on that, um, so we won't we won't dwell on that. But this calendar. Uh, fairly simple. It doesn't have that many uh, feast days for saints written in. Um, and it's missing uh, its first leaf because this is March. <laughs> and as you can see, there's one month per uh, side of each folio. So we're missing a leaf uh, with January and February, which sometimes uh, sometimes happens in, uh, in such books. Um, one uh, little clue that uh, Amy noticed when cataloging the book, and this is really interesting, is that um, we can establish a terminus postquem for when this book was made. That's, of course, the fancy way of saying the date after which the book has to have been made. And that's based on uh, the presence of the Feast of the Transfiguration here in August. Um, which uh, was established only in 1456. Uh, so here we see Transfiguratio Domini, the Transfiguration of Our Lord. So the fact that, that feast was only established in 1456 means we're dealing with a manuscript that's necessarily made after that date. And um, the, um, the calendar does not have the canonization of St. Bonaventure, who was an important uh, Franciscan saint. There are other Franciscan saints in this calendar. So we think that this is a missile related to the Franciscan order of preachers uh, in Italy. Um, but because we don't have St. Bonaventure who was canonized, so made a saint in 1482, we think that gives us a nice terminus antequem. Uh, and that's uh, thanks to Amy that we have that kind of, that we know that, that roughly 25 year period in which this book uh, must have been made. And that goes along with the style of the script, which you can see is a very careful, very formal uh, rotunda script, which is uh, typical of Italy. Um, it's sort of more open and rounded than a quadrata Gothic script used uh, elsewhere in Europe. No, 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 no. Um, um, just there's a new there's a manuscript here. Um, um, there's a question about uh, if we can see in the binding what happened to the missing sheet, um, the missing leaf uh, at the beginning of the calendar. There are also a, a couple of missing, at least a couple of missing leaves here um, before the text proper of the, of the missile starts. Um, and I'm not sure if it's really possible to tell from the binding um, whether those leaves were removed before or after this binding was added, which seems to be a fairly elaborate 19th century binding, uh, probably Italian. Um, but that's a very good question. Um, I mean, frankly, sometimes the first pages of calendars or of texts were removed because uh, they had uh, beautiful initials or illumination, or in the case of a calendar, it might have had uh, the name of a previous owner and somebody wanted to remove that long ago. And so that does sometimes happen. So that may be an explanation, but it's fairly common to have the first leaf or couple of leaves of a calendar um, missing. So uh, a missal, it's a very uh, kind of predictable type of book. They have a lot of variations. They're often very artistically beautiful, but the core texts they contain um, appear in a sort of predictable order. Um, and they begin with uh, the first half of what's called the temporale. So these are all of the masses um, from Advent through to Holy Saturday before Easter. And in the center of the book, you have the canon of the mass, which is the, the sort of invariable central text of the mass. Uh, so, that, so that would always be opened uh, at some point during the, the mass by the priest. And then you have the second half of the temporale, which runs... Um, from Easter, uh, uh, and then uh, from Easter um, forward, and that's in the second kind of half of the book. 
And then you have uh, the sanctorale uh, towards the end, um, which are masses for saints that, uh, that happen on uh, particular days of the month that are not related to the liturgical year that is movable, uh, that, relate, that is based on the day of Easter, which changes, of course, every year. Um, and then you have various sort of accessory masses, votive masses, masses that you say for different situations um, right at the end. So um, we have this wonderful, quite sort of open script. We have these two columns, which is very, very typical of a um, missal uh, or a breviary, which is sort of equivalent of the missal for the divine office. Um, but what makes this book sort of interesting to us and interesting to me as an art historian is that it has some beautiful initials. It actually has about 40 of them, uh, historiated and inhabited initials. And um, they begin here with um, the uh, Mass for Christmas. And you have a, a blessing figure of God the Father. I hope you can see that uh, fairly, uh, fairly well. And um, these are a kind of initial design with colors uh, that are typical of Northern Italy, right in the 15th century, middle to sort of, I would say to around 1450 to 1475. So again, that fits with the dates uh, that we know from the calendar. Um, and um, these sort of roll the Kansas leaves with the sort of pink, green, and blue, and then these sprays of uh, beautifully raised gilded um, uh, uh, foliage. This is very typical of sort of uh, manuscript illumination from the Veneto, uh, so from that area around Verona in this period. Um, and then we have um, further initials uh, around the feast for Christmas. Um, so the Virgin and Child, the Nativity here. Uh, and um, I hope you can see a bit of that detail um, through uh, through Zoom, and you can see the very thickly illuminated, thickly applied gold leaf. It actually um, has um, is very is very kind of raised, sort of above the very very heavily raised above the surface of the parchment. And again, this is a lavish book uh, meant for you know uh, the mass, the the central kind of liturgical event um, in the Catholic Church. So uh, we have a very uh, beautiful. Um, selection, very beautiful sort of selection of pigments, of, um, of gold and of uh, uh, design of these uh, initials. Uh, and then we have, uh, again, going through the Christian calendar, we then have uh, St. Stephen. So we have feast days um, and um, Someone's asking if the initials have been renovated. No, these are in original condition. Um, the actual style of the painting is sort of a little bit rushed. It, 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 so this is a painter who's not sort of, uh, certainly not a named master, this illuminator who did the scenes and the initials. Um, uh, we do know names of lots of sort of great illuminators from this period in Verona and elsewhere. Uh, but this is someone who's a little bit more maybe of a, um, apprentice or a slightly, uh, a slightly um, sort of more provincial uh, illuminator who's, who's making these initials, who seems to be the same artist as the person who did these acanthus leaves, because the palette is sort of the same and there's not a lot of disjuncture. Sometimes you get the central field of the initial made by a specific illuminator who's different from the illuminator who makes the foliage decoration, but I don't think that's the case uh, here. I hope you can see some of the shimmer. I think you can um, as, I turn, as I turn the pages. Um, so um, we had uh, St. Stephen, we have John the Evangelist uh, with his symbol here, the, uh, um, the Eagle, the Massacre of the Innocents, This is an interesting one. This is Thomas Beckett, right? Venerated in the Catholic Church. Another virgin and child. Uh, 
a sort of larger initial for the adoration of the Magi. I'm going to see if I can just, and just bear with me, I'm going to see if I can just manipulate the, the uh, camera to get you a better glimpse of that initial, because I realize that um, you might not be able to see some of the details. So just bear with me, don't get too dizzy uh, from the movement of the camera, but I want to show you some of the detail. There we go. That wasn't too disorienting. <laughs> Very little wear and tear, Joseph Kopta asks. And I think that's true. Um, so as I mentioned, these, you know, some you either get miss missiles generally that are sort of overused and that are falling to pieces. And we can infer from that that we that many were just thrown away and don't survive. And then we have missiles like this, which are very pristine. Now this has been trimmed down for its 19th century binding, that's for sure. But um, you also had situations where a missile might not to be, have to be used particularly frequently, um, particularly if it was a private altar. So of course, there were a lot of chapels commissioned in the later Middle Ages, especially in uh, Franciscan uh, convents that were private, that were to have masses said for the benefit of, uh, of the dead, right? So if you were a wealthy, uh, patron, you would sort of found a chapel and there would be masses that would be said by a priest just alone in a chapel. Uh, and that could lead to, you know, pretty minimal use of a book like this. And then, of course, then there, there are changes um, to the liturgy. Uh, if this is produced uh, in the second half of the 15th century, you then get printed missiles that appear soon after that might supplant this. And then you have the changes in the 16th century with the Counter-Reformation. Um, so you have um, you have changes to the liturgy. And so missiles like this become outdated and, um, and no longer used. And that, that's one of the reasons why you actually come across individual folios cut out of missiles, of missiles that have been gone entirely, um, that have been entirely cut up and sold off in individually, sheet by sheet to collectors in the 19th and 20th centuries. And um, we have that phenomenon that's quite widespread in North American collections. Uh, for example, the Bove missile, which is the great 13th century missile that we know of only through uh, its remaining leaves that uh, Lisa Fagan Davis and others have tried to, are trying actively to, um, to trace. So uh, we're lucky to have an entire intact missile like this uh, that's come down to us. So we skip ahead a little bit um, with the illuminated uh, letters. And I'm going to try to um, show you the central part of the canon of the mass, um, which starts on folio 130. And um, Someone is asking also what, uh, why I describe the illuminations as hurried. And that's maybe my, um, my uh, uh, colors of a, as an art historian that are kind of coming out. Um, but that's um, basically because uh, we know in this period of other uh, missiles and other liturgical books that are produced that are, you know, have an incredibly, uh, incredibly beautiful illuminations, very elaborate. Uh, with you know very elaborate sweeping landscapes in the background, many figures you know, that look like uh, large scale paintings, oil paintings of the time, uh, and this is not necessarily the case uh, with this book. Uh, and you know I wouldn't say that that necessarily means that they're rushed, but simply that this was an artist who um, spent less time and was perhaps cheaper than uh, some of the more accomplished artists um, like uh, Girolamo da. Uh, da Verona, who's one of the great illuminators of this period, who's known from as being from Verona, who was active in almost exactly the same time. Um, so uh, let me get to um, the the central part of the missal, which is called the canon, and uh, which um, starts with the 
initial T, this is te igitur, you therefore, most merciful father. This is familiar perhaps to uh, Catholics and um, other, other practicing Christians from the kind of uh, Sunday service. So this is a central part of the mass um, and always towards the middle of a missile. And it's usually faced with a large uh, illumination of the crucifixion. In this case, we don't have that. And I think we sort of have yet to determine whether that page has been taken out or, um, you know, it may never have been there, but um, this page, um, or the illumination with the crucifixion was meant to be kissed by the priest. In fact, uh, sometimes in the instructions for the priest, which are written in red, uh, you have instructions to kiss the image. And obviously over time, that leads to these images deteriorating. And in um, the missile that we acquired um, uh, in 2021, uh, we, we have a, an example of an illumination showing the crucifixion that's been, that's a replacement because presumably the original one got damaged. And these were sometimes kind of meant to be um, um, sort of replaceable images. Here we don't have, um, we don't have the, uh, that uh, sheet facing the, the te igitur, this T initial, which shows the priest um, holding up the host during the mass and uh, with a deacon holding up uh, his uh, uh, chasuble, right? So this is a, an image you frequently find in missiles and I'm gonna zoom in, not zoom in, I'm gonna hold the camera a little closer so you can see that detail, if you bear with me. And then there's a third figure you see here at the bottom left. And you can actually see, uh, interestingly, the book open on the altar, on the, on the white cloth in front of the priest. And that represents a uh, missile. So it represents a book like this, um, like this one. All right, sorry, it's a little bit difficult to sort of manipulate this book because it is quite large. And with the camera in front, um, it's a little bit, um, it's a little bit, uh, a little bit difficult. Um, all right, then we um, turn to the section of the missile for Easter onwards, right? So we have the resurrection, uh, which again has a large initial here. Um, and, um, And then we'll have the ascension coming up. You see that here on this side. Um, all right, and then. Uh, trying to show you all the images of which there are about 40. Um, here's Pentecost. It's another good one. I'm gonna also um, move the camera. Just bear with me, please. I don't think there's a sort of easier way to do this. Maybe there is, but um, that way you can see some of the gold. So that's the Pentecost with the dove representing the Holy Spirit descending on the apostles with um, those red lines which kind of represent the tongues of fire and the apostles miraculously being able to speak different languages. All right, now I'm gonna just hold this here. Um, see if I can sort of flip forward a little bit. This is the um, feast for uh, Corpus Christi. So you see there's another representation of an altar with a chalice and a paten, that little disc on top, and then the white uh, host of the Christian Eucharist. And then on the right, a little um, book, again, a missal. Do you read the script, do you read the text all the way through or just in? 
pieces. Well, this is this is actually um, one of the innovations of the missile, because this used to be um, kind of unwieldy for the priest before missiles became really more common in the 13th century. Um, the priest would have to switch between lots of different books, uh, like a, a, a lectionary and epistolary, all these different books that you needed to read from during one single mass. So this would be read from, um, um, you know, bits and pieces for each particular mass on a given day. Uh, and then there are central parts like the canon, which I showed you with that te igitur initial, that initial T that would be read from each time. So it's kind of a combination, but this uh, type of book basically made it more convenient for a priest to do that. It made it possible for everything to happen within one book. Um, so it's kind of innovative in that, in that sense. Okay, I'm gonna see if I can, I'm doing some sort of fancy <laughs> footwork with the camera. So uh, I hope that um, doesn't fall. I wanna be able to sort of give you a close up view of as much of the book um, as possible. So um, then we get to the part of the book that uh, is called the, the Sanctorale, or the pro Proprium Sanctorum, which is written here, um, or the, the proper of saints. And so these are, um, these are readings for uh, additional feast days that don't match up, that, 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 um, or that um, happen throughout the year, but on uh, fixed days. So we're going back to, this is St. Andrew, so this is, Going back to this is sort of the um, very end of November before uh, the beginning of Advent, so we're kind of going back uh, to the beginning of uh, where of this is now the Sanctorale, whereas the Temporale, which goes on the same across the year in the same way, um, began at the beginning of the Missal. Um, and here we have quite a few initials because we have quite a few individual. Uh, saints who are who are shown um now let me see right so we have saint andrew we have actually saint andrew twice because this is the vigil this is the night before the feast of saint andrew and then we have the actual feast of saint andrew um and we have uh another image of the virgin mary because um this is of the, the feast of the, the presentation of the Virgin Mary in the temple. I may be wrong. There may be better liturgists among us. These are might be there might be specialists of uh, this type of text, uh, and I'm a little bit rusty on some of it because it is sort of complex. Um, the way that the uh, liturgy works in the Catholic Church um, in this period, you know, is complicated, and it's this sort of these intersecting. Uh, time frames that repeat year to year, um, but some of which are fixed, some of which are based on the date of Easter. All right, so here we have, uh, this is the presentation of uh, the Virgin Mary in the temple. I, feel, I see we just have a minute left, so I'm, I haven't even shown you everything because this is so richly illuminated. But I hope I've given you a sort of idea of uh, what a sort of fairly uh, grand missile from um, mid 15th century Northern Italy looks like. And, um, and again, this is not yet digitized because it's a recent acquisition, but you can look on our catalog record at the amazing work that Amy has done in describing uh, each of these initials and each of the sections of the book. And we will very shortly, I think, have it digitized and we'll be able to leaf through it uh, virtually and uh, get a close up view of any of these wonderful initials. So thank you and uh, join us next week.